One guy's seen it, the other guy hasn't. First guy's gonna tell the second guy all about it. While they both get drunk. All right, welcome to yet another fantastic, sublime, amazing, superhuman, amazing, super time, happy time episode of One Guy's Seen It, the only podcast where one guy has seen the movie or TV show, um, based on sort of some of the stuff we've been doing recently, and the other guy most of the time has not seen it. Uh, again, uh, we, the last... Uh, regardless, this is a podcast with two friends who love talking about cinema and TV shows and 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 getting drunk and uh one guy seen it yeah not my best intro um <laughs> you know i've i've had better but uh without any more rigmarole hoopla ballyhoo or bull shiznit sumner give me the skinny get me off the mic just just I, uh, <laughs> that was beautiful that i feel like better because of all the <sighs> intros i fumbled over the <laughs> um I, I do have a skinny though i i have now officially seen Oppenheimer. I watched it this weekend. All right, I need to prepare myself. I need to prepare <laughs> myself for whatever opinions may come because <laughs> like I told you, I felt the way that I felt about it, but I was always yeah. willing to give it another chance, but I need your I need your skinny. My skinny um it was pretty good. I I didn't have any um any problems with it, but um I mean like the ones that I did were like I didn't really, I don't know much about Oppenheimer or the Manhattan Project other than surface level shit. So like the whole movie is like, it's three hours long, but it is like breakneck speed. Like if you're not paying attention to like all these like insanely finite details, it just, it goes so fast. And then it's like, Mm -hmm. there's the, you know, the whole courtroom drama, which takes up probably like the last hour of the movie hour and a half of the movie and uh you know which is i could appreciate like the acting from robert downey jr and killian murphy they they both did good jobs and like um i don't think it was anything i'd ever really go out of my way to watch again unless somebody <laughs> wanted to watch it but uh yeah i don't know yeah that was fine it was fine <laughs> it was a good movie <laughs> Yeah, you know, I appreciate I appreciate your honest opinion. I, I think I, I share most of those sentiments. I mean, I when I came away from it, I was I think I I probably said the same thing. Like like Killian Murphy's incredible. He always has been. Robert Downey Jr. was awesome. Yeah. Um And 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 you know, it was a cinematic uh, masterclass. Really, like I mean, the 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 shots were incredible. The atmosphere was incredible. I just the 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 Nolan breakneck pace that you're talking about totally just took me out of it, man. I don't know how to yeah. explain it. Like it it was just it felt so up its own ass. <laughs> I think those were my it, words. It definitely felt rushed for like a 3-hour movie. Like they were just trying to get to all these little things that he wanted to do uh wanted to do and there was something I noticed about the editing too. It's like, there's not a lot of space between lines of dialogue. And I, I think I've talked about this with other movies too, but it was just like, they'd be like, da, 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 da. like they would talk almost over each other. Like it was like, there was no pause or break between <laughs> their dialogue. Right, and so- I get, yeah, I get that that's a choice, right? Like I get that that's like, like no one's wanting to do that. He's wanting to make you feel like you're getting dragged through this thing at, yeah. at breakneck speed. But it's like, is that serving the story is it so like i i especially because did you watch it at home i did with subtitles which i think helped a lot yeah see and i'm willing to give it another chance in that in that scenario but in a theater at that speed with theater audio i i just yeah. i i gave up after about an hour trying to like hang on to every thing that was being said and it it felt like almost like the movie didn't want me to and yeah. I just it, it it ruined my immersion in a way, and I I, yeah. I I don't know I I from the beginning I I said that it was impressive in a lot of ways. That doesn't mean I have to like it. And I think my <laughs> my opinion was that it is that it was being way overblown as this incredible masterpiece. And yeah. I don't know if you feel that way. No, I do too. I don't I don't think it's anything. Um, I mean, I I, I appreciate 
you know, the willingness to like go after like an obscure kind of thing like that. And like, I think the, the concept of it is interesting going through the whole process of making the bomb and the moral like questions and stuff like is cool for like a big budget movie. Like it's actually interesting and, you know, at least unique, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to put into words the way I feel about it, but it's, um, it's just, it's got its problems like everything else. I would not call it a masterpiece at, at all. But I mean, like, I think it'll win Best Picture for sure. I think it's a very popular movie. Everybody's seen it mostly. And it's just, it's it's a safe pick. And nobody's going to get really upset about it. So it's one of those ones that's just, it's, it's like I, w- I would go to Vegas and bet. <laughs> put all my money on that Oppenheimer is going to win best picture just my Ugh, opinion on it <laughs> yeah it's but I, political I did, bullshit I, I I do hate to be this guy and I re- really hate to say this but it's like the one of the problems I had and I'm sure there's historical accuracy to this because there's a lot of historically accurate stuff in the movie so he he definitely did his research but all the female characters I thought were written really poorly and I don't really like try to pay attention to stuff like that. And I know people like do it to like a nauseating degree. It's like, oh, women could be, but like all the women in the movie were like such, like, because he's got his wife played by Emily Blunt, who's like the alcoholic, stay-at-home wife with the kids. And he's like, I'm trying to build the bomb, and she's like, I, I've got problems too with the kids. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that thing. And then he's. So he's like a notorious, uh, I don't know, womanizer. So he's like having affairs on the side constantly. And uh, and then this girl that he was with before, she was just like, like, I don't know, typical, like depressive woman who's like, I'm more complicated than you think. And like, he goes to see her and then she like ends up killing herself in the tub. I was like, I've definitely seen that in something else before. <laughs> I'm sure it happened, but the way it's written in the movie... And then there's that one like token female scientist character who comes in and then it's like it's like you know I can be part of the boys club you know it's just like and again I don't like trying to pay attention or go t- through that with a fine comb but it felt so uh, blatantly bland to me <laughs> the way that the female characters were written that it kind of started bothering me by the end of the movie which is it's not blatantly the main focus blatantly bland I like that <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, it's obviously not the main focus of the movie, so it's more of a nitpick than anything, but yeah, I, it was it was definitely to the point where I noticed, I was like, oh, that's pretty pretty thin, even for today's standards. Yeah, well, look, I'm glad, I'm glad that at least you shared some of the sentiments that I did, but, um, you know, today we're going to move on from, from a, <laughs> what is considered a masterpiece by everyone right now, to something that truly is a masterpiece that I think everyone can agree on and i i'm gonna move i, I want to do this because so so band of brothers was the first series that we did together right yeah and i i wanted to do i wanted to do a series that um <laughs> that that you that i know that you haven't seen or i'm pretty sure that you haven't seen okay um but that struck me as one of the best seasons of television that i've ever seen of anything ever Okay. And I think that there are a lot of reasons for that, and I really want to talk about the reasons for that, but in order to do that, we have to watch it together. So are you down for another series with me? It's just one season. Okay. How many uh, How many episodes? So uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> it is only eight episodes. Okay. That's not bad. It's only okay. eight episodes. And, and, and kind of the, the way I want to do it is, you know, I want to... It would suck... But but if, if we can do the first two episodes, I almost I'll give you the choice if you want to continue the series. I hope that we can okay. because because and for the record, I would love to do uh, not to get too far into our future content plans. But I was thinking about uh, I was thinking about continuing to watch Twin Peaks the other day, and I was like, you know what, <laughs> we could totally do a series because I haven't seen it, and I know you yeah. would love to talk about it. I would, so, yeah. I, I almost want to keep series in mind because I know there's some there's some incredible TV that I've seen that you haven't that you've seen that I haven't and yeah. I know we've got movies for days but I'm also thinking about the fact that it's way easier I think for me to find TV shows that you haven't seen <laughs> than it yeah, is for me true. to find movies that 
movies that you haven't seen that I'd even want to talk about. Like, I'm already running thin <laughs> on my uh, on my bullshit 90s sci-fi stuff. But <laughs> are you down to take this adventure with me today? Yeah, yeah I'm down to do it. And it would really suck if you've seen it, because that would, that would totally ruin all of this. <laughs> okay. But, okay. So, um... Yeah, and I don't even know, you know, it's it's kind of all over the place a little bit. But okay, so this is a series that the first season aired in 2014. Um, it was, it's directed and created and written by a guy named Nick Pizzolato. Pizzolato? Mm-hmm. Name ring a bell? Mm-mm. Not no. at all. Nick yeah. Pizzolato, okay. And this first season, this first season, and you're going to know it immediately, stars okay. uh, Matthew McConaughey. Woody Harrelson and Michelle Monaghan. I know what it is now. <laughs> you know what it is now, and you haven't yeah. seen it, right? No, I haven't. Okay, so I'm 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 gonna I will go to my grave saying that I think that this is one of the best seasons of television ever made, I and I think that it's it's really the cast that that carries so much of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think proof in the pudding is that the newest three seasons after this first season. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say have failed miserably, but have not been anywhere <laughs> near as like successful. And I think it's all the cast. I think the writing got a little diluted and, and the show didn't really know what it wanted to be, but we can get into all that shit. That's all shit that I want to get into. <laughs> yeah. But yes, this is the first season of True Detective, which okay. I think is widely considered by a lot of people to be a masterclass in television. Um, <laughs> and I think... A lot of people consider it to be a sort of lightning in the bottle situation. Like Nick Pizzolatto um, originally like wrote the script to be a novel, and um, I think was just kind of flying by the seat of his pants a lot of the time. And and yeah, it's just yeah. when people talk about it, they talk about it like like lightning in a bottle that that really has not been able to be recreated, even with Nick at the helm for season two and three. Yeah. Um, it just couldn't be recaptured, and I think a lot of that has to do with the cast, and also the timing of when it came out. Like, um, it, so I think it was the first. Oh yeah, this was crazy. So episodes averaged 11.2 million viewers, which is crazy. Like in 2014, there were a lot more people watching TV, obviously, but even then, it was insane. It was the most watched first season of an HBO show since Band of Brothers, which is kind of why oh, I wanted man. to do it. Yeah. <laughs> was it um? Was it HBO also? Yes, HBO. Yeah, and right. it was it was one of the first sort of series like Band of Brothers that HBO did that was really shot to be a lot more cinematic, and it was all shot on film and um. You know, I don't yeah. know if... I bet The Sopranos was. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. But um, but anyways... Um, yeah, it's cool. Like, and I, I think... I think the season one was originally planned to be just like just like a mini series, like a one off. And I kind of wish they would have done that because yeah. if they had, it would have lived in legend and lore forever. But they just couldn't say no to the money. And they yeah. turned it into an anthology when it, it never should have been. Um, yeah. It should have been a one and done series because it was perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I've, I've, oh, sorry. That's my, that, no, it's okay. That's my opinion. I, it's, it's, but, but we'll, we'll get to that. I'm, I, I'm sure you might not think it's perfect or you might think it's perfect. <laughs> All I know is I want to watch it with you because it's been so many years since I've seen it. And I remember just fucking eating it up. Yeah. And it's, it's so funny that I've avoided it for the, not even avoided, but I was like, oh yeah, I'll get around to it. And I've, I've heard nothing but good things about it for, I guess almost 10, 10 years now. We came out 10 years ago. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, we're so inundated, you know, it's like true crime culture is more pervasive than it's ever been. And, and really it started around this time with podcasts like Serial and you just got this now granted America has always been wildly fascinated with true crime and it's it can get yeah. beaten to death this is not true crime this is fictional detective drama right like but it <laughs> it sort of it was perfect place in time like I feel like if this show had come out a couple of years later people wouldn't have cared as much yeah. but it was right place right time right vibe um, right cast like right. just anyway um, I don't know if there's anything more I want to tell you like <laughs> there's tr- there's, tr- there's so much of the really cool trivia is not necessarily like 
spoiling things, but it, a lot of it kind of spoils stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You know, well, what's interesting is like the first season, it was talking about Nick Pizzolatto, like he, he wrote it as a novel first, and he, he wrote this whole first season without any input from any other writers, which if I if I know anything is pretty unusual, right? For like a major television series. Mm-hmm. Like, is that unusual for one guy to write the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty unusual. Well, I mean, if it's miniseries form, well, no, I even in that, I think it's, um, I think if it's a singular fictional vision like that, maybe it's more common. But I, I haven't heard mm-hmm. of the even like a miniseries or TV show being done that way, at least in a while. I think it's pretty pretty rare when it happens. Yeah, it's it just everything everything that I've because because I remember kind of coming across after I finished the first season like I just couldn't get enough and like I remember watching like YouTube videos of people breaking it down and just uh just so many people saying that that it uh, the, the phrase that I kept remembering hearing over and over again was lightning in a bottle lightning in a bottle so I don't want to overhype it because you know like you know detective beat dramas are they're very sp- particular type of thing but i think that the reason that this was so successful because it's like so much of it's been just beaten to death right it's sure. it's mcconaughey and and uh and harrelson like the way that their characters play off of each other is uh, anyway anyway no more bullshit we've we've <laughs> bullshitted enough um are you down to watch this pilot with me have i convinced you you have convinced me yes i'm, I'm ready to watch Yes. Okay. We we are gonna go watch the first episode. Well, maybe we could do two. If we we yeah, do the we'll first, do or we could do one and two. You want to do two? Yes, yeah, you two. Okay. We're gonna do episodes one and two of the first season of True Detective from HBO. When you hear that trumpet sound, spoilers are on the way. So we'll be back, bitches. All right, we're back. We are back, some diddly umster, <laughs> with uh, episodes one and, two one and two of True Detective of the first season. Yeah. How how you feeling? What, um, what what's your overall vibe? It was pretty fucking great. I'm not gonna lie, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I was I was pretty hooked immediately. I think. God, it makes me so happy. See, okay, so I was worried about doing a series like this because the thing with Band of Brothers, right, is like each each episode is is almost like a movie in and of itself. Like they, they yeah. all work as standalones because there's these huge, you know, well, not huge jumps in time, but each episode almost serves as its own mini movie of the war. And, yeah. you know, this is a very different thing where you've got this story kind of slowly unfolding and it's it's yeah. tough to really like review review the plot in any way because you have no answers so i yeah it seems like the only things we can really talk about are sort of your overall um like just reactions to the to the show like yeah like like, i don't know like where do you want to start yeah i'm like what to assess thus far um i guess we just started the beginning um but uh yeah i was uh yeah i was really into it and i really liked the framing device with them getting like um deposed or whatever or questioned by the police so you kind of have like yeah because you kind of jump ahead i think 17 years later i think i think is what they said yeah something like that yeah yeah there's and it's it's funny too because like so each season sort of does this um these time jump kind of things well the second season not so much they they kind of return to form in seasons in season three but yeah um but yeah, that's kind of like one of the big hooks of the show is the kind of the timeline jumps and trying to piece together in your mind sort of what's <laughs> happening where and why. But anyway, continue. Yeah, and um, so I guess I was trying to remember the first thing that happens is uh, well, they're getting you know their question. I didn't write down a lot of notes because I was just trying to pay attention to what was happening. But um, yeah, and there are some great lines of dialogue. But I guess we should just start with like you know the the murder that they're investigating with the girl out in the woods yeah uh which is, her name's dora lang i think yeah dora lang and uh they uh go out into the woods and uh i think uh like 
Matthew McConaughey's character is like kind of a new guy. Like he just gotten sent to them, so they, uh, Woody Harrelson and him got like paired up recently. Like classic like detective like <laughs> working at odds with each other, but it's done really well in the show. I think they uh, <laughs> they convey him as like a really um, nihilistic kind of you know weird dude, and then um, Woody Harrelson is this you know uptight like christian family man kind of guy so they have like these polar opposite viewpoints which i think is really uh interesting yeah yeah and i think that's that's what you'll find too over the course of the season is that's that's sort of like the strength of the show it's kind of the the just the dichotomy between these two totally different totally polar opposite characters yeah which is interesting because like when i first like saw what their characters are going to be i was like it almost seems like it should be reversed like like McConaughey being like the family man of like uh Woody Harrelson being like you know kind of the crit that would be like if you were like typecasting him in those roles it's like where you'd place them but honestly Matthew McConaughey's fucking perfect in it I was I had no he's great as a uh, as that character yeah he's so good and it's like it's a fine line right because like you said he's this this over the top kind of nihilistic um fucking worldview and every fucking word that comes out of his mouth is insanely depressing and he <laughs> clearly has this dark past and history that's and it's you know like the first couple of scenes with him it's a little jarring you're like okay this is McConaughey doing his thing and it's like <laughs> it's it's almost it's the perfect amount of over the top like the way that he sells it it's like there's yeah. a fine line right it could it could be really cheesy and bad but but you know three or four lines into the deposition you're totally on board <laughs> yeah you're like you're totally on board with this guy that he's playing and i i think the key to the character is ambiance too it's like like just his tone like you feel that it's genuine and he gets that across really well i think because it could very easily come off like um you ever heard of that subreddit like um i'm 14 and this is deep and it's like all these like yeah, philosophical yeah, so I've, quotes. Yeah, I've seen that shit. Of like, yeah. you know, like high school level philosophy, but it really doesn't come off like that. I, I actually some of the stuff he says is really like deep and interesting. His worldview, and uh, yeah, it gets you. I mean, like, so also yeah, like you said, you know, you start off with this with this crazy murder out in a out in yeah. a field. I mean, the opening shot is 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 the staging of the body kind of taking place very vaguely which is so crazy because like you know i saw this years ago and i don't remember that opening shot at all because it yeah kind of happens so fast and you have no information you, you know you, you there's no reason for you to assume anything of, of what you're looking at but yeah. it was crazy that it was so clear to me this time that you're literally seeing you know this woman's body get placed and the field lit on fire yeah. around the tree but the way that it's sort of shot is so di- like you're so disconnected from it. I just thought it was interesting. It was something that I didn't notice the first time. Yeah, um, yeah. That that. Because why would show. you? Like you have no you have no context for what you're seeing. But you know, I've seen the show, so I know what I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, it's like all done in silhouette, like at the very beginning. Like you just see like their yeah. uh, outlines going through the woods. Yeah, dude, it's awesome. But yeah, but like you said, they come across. They come across this body mm-hmm. um, of a young girl in her 20s. She's, like, up in this pose. She's naked. She's got this, like, antler crown. Yeah. This weird spiral on her back. It's like, uh, they say pretty, it's, like... Pretty clearly a... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, like, they... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, they make the comment. It's, like, a... They think it's, like, a satanic ritual or something like that. And it's, like, like potentially. Um, but... Uh, Ross Matthew McConaughey's character is pretty sure that it's like you know serial killer, like a like a John Doe from Seven kind of thing going on, and it's like all placed yeah. very, and they have those uh those things, those little like uh, wooden tent things that they call like devil nets. I think it's like to ward off like the devil from getting you or something. Yeah, clearly some ritualistic stuff. And you know, I love this kind of little detail too, because you know, this early part of the case is taking place in '95, yeah. And it was uh, Satanism mania. You know, like I actually saw a documentary recently on how insane 
like the 90s uh like the media's obsession with satanism was during the 90s mm -hmm. like i mean almost any kind of murder that was in any way strange like it, oh it's satanism like it was all <laughs> anybody was talking about yeah and so it's it's funny to me that you know they they really lean into it here and it's like you know that shit was happening all over the country at the time which i think is kind of a cool little detail yeah and they were even doing that with like uh rock and roll music or like um like alternative music it's like it's devil music or you know something like that like conservative like side of the political spectrum was like oh it's rotting our youth and it's like turning them to kill each other all this hateful music <laughs> it's like yep. killing kids something stupid like that but <laughs> Yeah, just, yeah, I wish you, we could we could retroactively be like, oh, you just wait. There's this game called Grand Theft Auto coming out pretty soon. <laughs> it's right on the horizon. Just you wait. <laughs> I, d I did love when he's um, he's kind of analyzing the body and he's got his uh, little notepad out, which they call him the tax man because he has this giant notepad and he's like drawing yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm the tax <laughs> man. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. But, um, and he's like, he's really good at drawing things too, like quickly, which is <laughs> kind of a funny detail. Um, yeah, but very gets, LA noir in how accurate his quick <laughs> sketches are. Yeah, I love that in the game too, where it just like he just goes Whoosh, and it's like done in two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's like perfect, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like a lifelike rendering of somebody's face <laughs> in like two seconds. It's just so it's so funny you brought that up because I one of my notes is LA noir sketches. Like it's it's just funny. We're yeah. on this totally on the same page there. Yeah, and I I think I wrote down for him as like uh he's like a nihilistic sherlock holmes like he's he's um he's portrayed as like hyper intelligent but very antisocial. and then um his partner played by uh woody harrelson i think his name is hart is like kind of yeah, like, marty he's like the polar opposite he's not like the best detective he's kind of middle of the road but he's like good at talking to people or like you know knowing the norms of where he's at kind of thing and, uh, yeah, he's your he's your everyman. He's kind of like yeah. the the everyman voice of reason. Yeah, at least for in the first episode, <laughs> and then, like it goes kind of crazy in the second one. Yeah, it turns right. out these are very complicated, layered characters. Yeah, the yeah the layers get peeled back a bit in the second episode, which I which I enjoyed a lot. There was a lot of like character stuff that was really interesting in the second episode. Um, but I mean, getting back to like where we were. Um, so yeah, they, they find the body out and then um, you get like a sense that like uh, uh, Matthew McConaughey's character is kind of like on the verge of exploding at any time. And uh, it, uh, Woody Harrelson invites him to uh, dinner with his family <laughs> and that kind of mm -hmm. sets him off a bit. And they have just great lines of dialogue where he's just like, he's like trying to get him to open up and then he says something deep and weird and he's like okay shut the fuck up don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> like dude so I, ha I have to stop you here so l like i said I've, I've i've seen the show right and and i have to say that that scene in the car with them when mm -hmm. they are driving away from from the initial crime scene yeah is i can say this now even without going any further into the series is my favorite scene in the whole series <laughs> yeah it's because great. you you you, it does such a great job of telling you everything that you need to know about both of these characters in, in a very simple shot, just classic two detectives in a car kind of thing that's been done a million times. But you learn everything you need to know about how their relationship is going to be and their character dynamics yeah. in, in like a couple minute scene. Um, it's just yeah. it's the lines are so great, man. It really feels like you're reading a, a kick ass book. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wrote that down, too. It like it unfolds like a novel does, like it kind of. You know, it's got the framing device of them, you know, telling the story and you kind of get it revealed slowly through the other detectives interviewing them that like, you know, it's not they don't want to just hear the story again because they like lost the files. There's something that they're trying some detail that they're trying to uncover from their stories. And it's like kind of yeah. adds a layer to the mystery on top of the mystery kind of thing, which is cool. Keeps it uh, like fresh without it like being about this one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait. So, 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 
So going back to that that car scene, right? And I don't I don't remember if because I think that car scene sort of takes place with a couple of gaps between it. Mm-hmm. But there's but Marty Marty has a line. Woody Harrelson's character has a line that I've been quoting and repeating for years that I have to bring up here. Yeah. Um, which is like after you know after he decides you know what he's like I wanted you to open up but now all I do all I want you to do is shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. He's like uh. He has this line where he's like, let's make the car a place of silent reflection from now on, okay? And, like, I have said that so many times in the car with Kaylee, like, when we're arguing about, you know what, let's make the... And it's funny, too, because she has not seen the show, so she doesn't get the... It's just for me. I just... But, but yeah, I had to point out that line because it's something that stuck with me. It's great, yeah. And then, like, he he breaks attention. He's like... uh, well, what should I bring to dinner? He's like, bottle of wine. He's like, oh, I don't drink anymore <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And just like, and that's the thing too I appreciated because there's a lot of times you'll watch like a TV show or a movie and like you kind of get bogged down with like the flashiness of like what the director or the writer is trying to do, trying to like spice it up or like, you know, all these like crazy shots or crazy angles or the writing is like a little over the top, like trying to like convey like, drama but like the way it's done in the show is really nice because it's just very stripped back it's not trying to like beat you over the head it just lets the characters and the story unfold very natural naturally which i loved like it, it got me hooked very quickly with that style yes i'm so happy i'm so glad you like it because yeah. i'm i'm excited to get to like to really get back into it it's funny too i noticed sort of how if you're not really paying attention it's it's easy to miss that this is this is louisiana i mean you get some cajun yeah. accents later on but you know all you really the only info you get that you're in louisiana period is is just like the the text info during the depositions <laughs> but um yeah but they're you know they're clearly in this this really rural beat down part of uh part of louisiana yeah and uh and it's you know there's this scene where and i don't know if it's the same car scene or like one later but uh but cole rustin uh, mm-hmm. uh has this line where he's like is it the faded memory like, of the all... town kind of line so so there's that coming up which is mm-hmm. great but oh, yeah. he's they're talking about he's like man and the, these people don't even realize it's like they're living on the moon it's all <laughs> one big gutter man a giant gutter in outer space <laughs> yeah I love that line. That was so great. <laughs> like, Can you just stop saying odd shit? <laughs> yeah. Cody Harrelson's so great. Like, the way that they play off each other is so, so awesome. But, yeah, and that was the thing I was like, I, I knew a little bit about the show going in. Like, I, I was familiar enough with, you know, like, the character. Like, I, I knew that he, like, kind of said, like, weird, edgy shit like that. And I was like, oh, it's going to be one of those. Oh, you already knew that? Oh. I mean, like, I mean, the show is supposed to know things. <laughs> well, the show is so famous. It was like almost hard to avoid kind of thing because there's like memes on the Internet of like him saying stuff. And um, but uh, but yeah, I was just I was I was really surprised how uh, how well it worked in execution. And like McConaughey doesn't really ham it up at all. Like he plays it really straight, which is really, really good. Like he does a really great job at it. And I think this was during his reconnaissance where he was getting known as like a more serious actor. He's like winning Oscars for yeah. Dallas Buyers Club. Yeah, and we're stuff. talking Yeah, we're talking a year after Dallas Buyers Club. Yeah. Which they were probably filming at the time that that was getting released or maybe even a little right, bit before yeah. that. So he was like in his like prime like acting stuff. And yeah, he's fantastic. I really it's like probably one of the best things i've ever seen him in just from the first two episodes yeah dude he's i could i could honestly just watch him drink lone star and smoke cigarettes <laughs> for two hours like i don't even care yeah what was his line about like uh uh like it hits noon he's like okay i gotta make a beer run boys <laughs> and he's like he's like whoa, whoa, whoa and he's like on my days off i start drinking at noon and you're not gonna get me <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> yeah and it's awesome too because like you know it's like it's very they make it very obvious early on in the interactions with him that he he clearly has a lot of leverage in this situation like yeah 
you learn very quickly that like they're gonna put up with put up with all of his bullshit because they desperately need whatever yeah. information that they're after and they, he's just gonna take full advantage of it yeah they need his testimony and they know he's a good detective but it also seems that they're trying to find a way to implicate him in some way I mean you know more about the show than I do but it, it like get that vibe because they keep asking um Marty questions like what did Russ do how did Russ handle that situation like they're trying to find more out about him either it's to help them with their interview or it's like they're trying to get him on something which I I don't know it's like something fishy going on which is which is great yeah I, man there's a lot there's a lot to be revealed a lot to be unveiled I almost don't even want to um, finish it because I like all that mystery <laughs> like well, what's great about this? Sh- well, look, I just you, you trust me. You will not be a short on mystery at any point um, throughout the show. There are plenty of plenty of twists and turntables. <laughs> I, I was already um, thrown for a loop, uh, like early on. Like I was. Um, it, anyway, yeah, we'll we'll get into more of that. But yeah, there's so many great scenes. Just even in the first episode, because they don't. I, that was one of the things that was great about the like the pilot or I guess the, you know, the opening episode, which is that they just kind of get right into it. They don't really like give you a whole lot of backstory up front. They don't try to give you all this filler shit. It's like, you know, you get to see the crime scene and then it's like, he's having dinner at, um, Marty's house and like you get introduced to the family and all that stuff. And it's just like, you know, it's like, that's like right up front. So you get everything you need to know about all the important characters that are surrounding. It was just, it was great. Like they didn't beat around the bush. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, and it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do good pacing with a show like this, where it is kind of slow and laid back, and you know it's a slowly unraveling mystery. And I think that's something that a lot of people say about the show is that even if it, even if you don't realize it, like there's always something happening. They're they're constantly moving on to the next lead, the next. Mm-hmm thing the next scene or it's jumping between timelines there's there's no there's not really any lulls you're and even in parts of the show that you could be conceived as lulls you're still getting super valuable you know character background information or case background information or everything is gonna be important and i feel like a lot of shows like this that where you know like a detective drama where there's a big mystery or whatever there's gonna be so much filler and and whatever like all of this none of it feels like filler and it's not like everything's important yeah which is which is cool and i think that's like the only thing that um, makes like a mystery noir thing like interesting on like a repeat viewing is like if the characters are really good and interesting and like they're a little bit mysterious as well yeah there's there's lots of cool shit on the way and it's like you said i liked it sort of i like that we kind of get a lot more character development in, in the second episode like you you know you don't have to spend the season wondering why uh, <laughs> Russ and Cole is so dark and brooding like you, yeah. you get some pretty quick answers that make some sense and his dude his I mean like his background Cole's backstory is fucking bananas yeah. like <laughs> yeah because I forget what he said he's he started in robbery yeah and then he ends up like transferring to to vice or narcos and He's got this this crazy story where he's like, he's like, you know, it's, obviously he he reveals that his his daughter has died in a in a tricycle accident and he and his wife's <laughs> drive away, just fucking just, tragic, obviously. So, sorry, just the way that you said that, it was like I just imagined a man on a tricycle burning over a toddler, and that made me, that made me laugh. Yeah, you know, uh, tri- tricycle manslaughter, tricycicide. Um, yeah, tricycicide with Trisic- big wheels. It's tricicide. a really big problem in rural. <laughs> tricicide. That sounds wrong. Something about that just sounds really wrong. Yeah. Triple homicide. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, yeah death by sorry. big wheel. It's not the way anybody would want to go. Yeah, run over by a big wheel. <laughs> over and over again, three times. Damn, I wonder how fast you'd actually have to be going on a Fisher-Price big wheel to kill somebody. If myth... If Mythbusters was still around, I would I would send that into the show. Yeah, man. I wonder whatever happened to Mythbusters. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Don't rem- don't remember. It was a great show, though. Yeah, it was. But we're yeah, talking but, about okay, an so even anyway, better show. We are, yeah. And so you know, you get you get this uh, this crazy backstory. He transfers to Narcos, and and you know, like he has this <laughs> this nuts line where he's like. 
you know, somewhere in there, my wife left, and then yeah. I ended up em- emptying a nine millimeter into a crankhead who was trying to inject his infant daughter with crystal meth. <laughs> And he just, just like, like very casually, monotonously, you're like fucking shit, man. Yeah. yeah, the most insane string of words you could put into, and it it somehow works. It doesn't come off as like comical or anything. Like you take it really seriously when he says it. Yeah, I mean he he sells the shit out of it, but you know yeah. you get in in three sentences you get exactly why he is the way that he is. Yeah, and um. I think I wrote down too when they're they're first driving back from the the crime scene. I was like, uh, I wrote down the Sherlock Holmes thing, but then after that, I was like, oh, it's like a, it's like if another serial killer had to catch a serial killer the way he's he was acting early on, like his like yeah, total man. despondency and like because he's not th- like you get a glimpse of like his humanity like at that first dinner kind of thing where he opens up to a uh, Hart's wife about his. Um, his wife and his daughter dying like pretty openly and like without making a big deal out of it and just you know right like bringing it up like because she asked kind of thing and uh and it's a great touch too that he like comes to the dinner like fucked up and then like like get some coffee and like tries to get him to sober up and he's like hey, i'll make a call and like you know get you out of here because you're fucked up and he ends up staying because he's just enjoying the company yeah, yeah. I don't know. Just, just um, nice little character stuff. I, I appreciated. God, there's just there's so much shit I want to tell you that I just I can't. <laughs> yeah. it, that's not the way this works. Yeah, and then um, oh gosh, yeah. Where do we go from there? <laughs> um, yeah, it's easy. It's easy for for these two episodes to kind of blend together because you're. It could, it's, it's like we said. It's it's you. You almost the whole show almost kind of feels like an acid trip. Like you're you're jumping <laughs> back and forth between these timelines. You're getting a little more information here and there, but it's like watching them. It just it all kind of blends together into one, um, one mystery. But you know they 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 start getting leads with the with um, like going to the whorehouses and mm-hmm. um, he he you know you you get you get the the impression early on that Rust has no problem you know, jumping into the underbelly and putting himself in incredibly dangerous situations. It's, he to, was uh, undercover to, for four years when he was on Narco or something like that, right? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. That was, yeah, that's like kind of the end of his his whole, like, life stories. Yeah, he, after he, I guess, killed that, um, the crankhead injecting his infant <laughs> with meth. Yeah. Um, he ends up getting put on, yeah, put on like this crazy undercover detail where he's just like, it's almost like, and it's an insane, he, he, he passes over, like he talks about it so quickly that you're just like, okay. But like, if you think about what really went down, like yeah, the, the police department or the, the, however many police departments he was working with just like all agreed, okay, this guy's life is fucked already. So <laughs> let's just use him. Right. Like he's, a he's, he's gonna f- be a fucked up addict anyway. So let's, let's <laughs> give him a reason to be so that we can use it. It's just kind of fucking bananas. Like it makes yeah. you wonder if, if, <laughs> if that kind of thing ever actually happens or if it happened. Maybe. I'm sure it did. Well, yeah, because, like, he had kind of, like, gone off the deep end afterwards, and he had, he had like, mentioned casually that he'd kind of fried his brain, like, doing drugs while he was undercover. So now he's kind of, like, got this... He, like, sees shit every now and then. Like, he kind of, like, floats in and out of this state of, uh... Yeah, and that's gonna, that's gonna become a really cool theme of the show, is this sort of, like, borderline supernatural element that you never really know... Um, that you never really know the significance of because Rust is so fucked up in the head. <laughs> there's like, this, which just makes it great. There's this funny line when they're in the car and he's like, uh, and it, it has more significance when you like know that backstory. But <laughs> it was funny when he said it. He's like, he's like, I don't sleep. I just dream. And then uh, Woody Harrelson just looks over at him like, shut the fuck. He just looks at him so mad. He's so pissed off. No, that's, yeah, he repeats it. He's like, what did we say about silent reflection or whatever? <laughs> I forget. Or maybe he doesn't say it right there. Maybe he says that later. Yeah, yeah it was just, when you first heard that, it was like, it almost seemed like he was just trying to fuck with him by saying that. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, great. 
Yeah, but and what's her face is awesome too. Marty's what you know. Yeah, so I guess we can talk about Marty for a little bit. Oh you know, yeah, that we, fucking guy. We, <laughs> yeah, that fucking guy. Here, I'll let you go. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So Michelle Monaghan, he's got like this, you know, beautiful, wonderful family. They're very supportive and sweet, and he's just a <laughs> fucking cock the whole time. Like fucking cock, man. Yeah, he just um. And it was funny when I saw what's her face show up, um, Alexandria Daddario. That you know that that girl. Uh, yeah, who, yeah, who, from was the, like, yeah, from Percy Jackson. Yeah, the secretary lady. I was like, they they had a little moment like in the office. I was like, oh, they're I bet they're boning, and of course they were. <laughs> there you revealed. go. And uh, I didn't expect how um, graphic that sex scene was going to be. That was insane. I was caught off guard yeah, completely. Man. Hey, I oh mean, this God. was peak HBO. They knew what they had to give people to keep them interested. Yeah, but I was like, Jesus Christ. And so, yeah, he's like, uh, what was he saying? He was like, uh, he's like, you know, you don't take your work home with you. He's like, I'm doing it for the good of my wife and my family. <laughs> By like seeing this, I don't know, office Yeah, everybody needs a release. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just the most douchebag way to go about it. <laughs> like... Uh, yeah, and he's like, um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, he goes over to her place and like gives her shit for like, like I don't know, like wanting to date other guys or something like that. <laughs> it's just, he's just being a dick the whole time, the whole second episode. I was like, oh, I fucking hate this dude so much. Yeah, yeah, you get and you, you get it from from when he's hanging out with her, and also you know later in the episode when he's when he's arguing with with um, with his wife, it's like. He, all he wants is what he wants and needs, regardless of what anybody, because, you know, yeah. he's, he's telling his, his mistress, like, no, you can't go be with another guy, because this is what I need. Right. I need my cake. Yeah. And to eat it, too. And Jesus he's saying Christ. the same yeah, shit to his life. wife. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm like, I didn't, shoot me. I didn't expect him to, like, start eating out her ass. That was fucking, that caught me off guard, too. I was like, Jesus Anyway, sorry. Yeah, man. Not to get they had to give the that, bloggers but... something to talk about, you know. I guess so. Yeah, that was uh, even for today. I was, I was shocked <laughs> to see that. But anyway, um, but yeah, he's just kind of a he was he's kind of a tool. Yeah, and then he comes home and like pretty much takes it out on his wife, which is <laughs> what he said he <laughs> wasn't gonna do. <laughs> right. And uh, and it was funny too because he's like complaining. He's like, I work all day. And then, like, Russ is out doing all the actual detective work while he's, like, yeah. bitching about all this other <laughs> <Right>. stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just kind of funny, like, kind of ironic. He's, like, complaining and whining and, like, taking it out on people. And it's just, like, it's just, like, him with his own fucked up shit going on. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, the, I mean, these guys are not heroes, neither of no, them. You no, you know, and, and the show lets you know that very quickly. But they're it gonna made me, have their likable moments and they're gonna have their hateable moments. It just made me like Russ a lot more because it's like, like uh, Hart's character is way more of a hypocrite because he's giving him shit about all this other stuff and he's such a hypocrite, like in the way that he conducts his personal life. <laughs> he's like got no yeah. room to talk almost. At least, uh, at least uh, uh, McConaughey's character has got an excuse. He's got a fucked up backstory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, we've. I guess we we've done we've mostly talked about you know their um you know we've mostly <laughs> talked about their uh the, the sort of their character dynamics and and sort of how they work together and that'll you know that'll continue to develop and get even more interesting yeah kind of as the show goes on but um but I guess so story wise let's let's try to kind of figure out where we are by the end of this second episode right like yeah. you that's a good they're, question because they're was... hunting. I was kind of yeah struggling with the details sometimes. Yeah, well, and that's the thing you really you really don't have any answers at all um, this early on in the show. Like all all they've they've really figured out is that you know they know the name of the girl, they know that she was kind of a vagrant and and working as a prostitute, and you know Cole goes around questioning, um, goes around questioning other prostitutes, trying to figure out who knows her, and they end up coming across this uh, this. Uh, bunny ranch, this hillbilly bunny ranch. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was, you know, a really interesting scene, and I thought that the uh, the madam, or however you want to refer to her, uh, 
position was great you know yeah she has this this little she has this little you know gotcha fuck you conversation with marty yeah where he's you know he's like yeah you know i'm gonna tell the sheriff you got underage girls in here or whatever and yeah you know she, she does this whole thing like that's the problem with you fucking men or whatever like you you know you don't own it the way that you thought you do like right. women are giving out sex for free all the time but she, she just she had a great little monologue i just wanted to yeah. give her a shout i just out. thought it was I, I thought it was such a cop out when she said that though i was like he's like she's still you're still prostituting an underage girl <laughs> it's like that's you know not an excuse yeah it's almost like she gives off a vibe that she knows that she knows him and like what he's up to which i don't i don't think is the is the case like, yeah. like it's just sort of this weird little implication but it clearly like she saw right through him and knew exactly what she needed to say to get him to back off right and i think too it's and, like uh, she's maybe coming from a place it's like i was there too like you know what the fuck are you trying to say kind of thing yeah 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 but i mean so they they end up you know finding the girl's diary here, and yeah. and there are some some crazy scribbles about a yellow king and uh, you know a bunch of angels and mm-hmm. and they uh, they end up trying to hunt down this church that that she supposedly was attending according to all these according to all of her I guess you could call them her associates. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, and yeah, and that's pretty much all we all we know in the story so far. The only other real real story details that are going on is, you know, when they find this church, clearly there's a connection at the end of episode two. You know, Rust has this weird supernatural experience where he sees the crows kind of turn into the same shape that was, you know, painted on the back of the dead yeah. girl. Yeah. And and then they, they go into this church. And one thing I wanted to point out that's so funny in this, this last scene of episode two is, like, they walk in and the church is burned up and beat to shit. And like Marty walks to the end of the church and he's like, well, it's torn up, like absolutely nothing to see here. Like right. he didn't look around at all. He did absolutely no detective work. He took one step inside and was like, well, we're fucked. There's no way we'll figure anything out. Right. And Cole, Cole like moves one thing and is like, here is an incredibly important clue. It was just, it was so dumb. He had a great line. He's like, uh, he's like, sometimes I think I'm insane or other times, uh, I thought I was mainlining the secret truth to the universe. I thought that was a really great line. Yeah, dude. Yeah, they, there's he he doesn't want to admit it. He's, he's there's a little ego in there, you know. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it's uh it's justified because he, he does his fucking job. <laughs> like, yeah, no shit. And yeah, and you get you get another thing too that's going to be kind of a point of contention. Um, is this new uh this new um task force. That yeah. the I believe the governor has put together to investigate occult crimes. Yeah, Tuttle um, is the governor's name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's gonna that's gonna be an interesting thing as the story goes on. But I mean, that's really that's really where we're at. Which is just which is just proof in the pudding of how great the atmosphere and the um the sort of the character development and and the dialogue is in these first two episodes that we we basically have no story and like I'm still hooked because. Yeah the writing is so fucking good yeah and you got your like basic hook but you like also need to be on board with the characters to a certain extent and um but yeah that's an interesting thing with the task force because it's like putting pressure on them to come up with something doesn't matter if it's like right or wrong which i think like through the interviews kind of gets like it's gonna like bite them in the ass because they come up with the wrong answer obviously because that's like already kind of revealed we shall see. We <laughs> shall see as things continue. But um, but yeah, I mean that's pretty much all I got, man. I don't know if you had any uh, any final thoughts or things you wanted to cover. Yeah, I don't I really don't think so. Um, I think we got it all. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, it was great. Really enjoyed but it. You think you're gonna dig it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's been really good. <laughs> I I kind of wanted to just keep watching afterwards. <laughs> Nah, ah, ah, ah. Not today. <laughs> no, no, no. Not today. You have to experience it the way that I mean. It's insane to me that you know uh, the viewership was bananas. I mean, the, the episodes averaged eleven point two million. Like yeah. it was every week, people were tuning into this shit. And I even remember too, because I was, I guess, I was a freshman in college or whatever when this was coming out, or maybe a sophomore. But like, I remember people talking about it. Yeah. Like fucking everybody was watching it. And it has that like um 
that film quality to it too. Like it feels just like a really long movie. And yeah. you know, when you got Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, that re- that really helps a lot with like the legit- legitimacy of it too. Um, yeah. You know, that's something that's kind of interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no, I just like, it toes that line between like true crime and like pulp, like uh, noir fiction really well. Like it, it strikes a good balance where it doesn't get too dull and it like keeps it entertaining, but it like keeps it grounded at the same time. It's like a, it's a good dance between those elements. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no matter what, the bottom line is Rusty and, and Marty are, are going to carry it. You know, it's, it's funny, yeah. like in the show, in the show, I, you know, Matthew McConaughey is playing, basically playing an atheist, right? Like this nihilist atheist and, and Woody Harrelson's a, a Christian, but in reality it's, it's reversed. Yeah. Uh, he's Harrelson's like, a, uh, He's like the Puritan <laughs> monk and like, he's like, well, uh, like he's in the, he's like buying drugs from the, the hooker or something like that. And he's like, she's like, <laughs> she like just starts showing him her vagina and he's like, no, not interested. No, thanks. And then he's no, like, no, no, no. I mean, I mean the actors like, like McConaughey oh, is a Christian yeah. in real life, Yeah, but he's playing an atheist <laughs> yeah. and Woody Harrelson is is an atheist in real life but he's playing a christian i just thought that was funny no that is an interesting point yeah because I, I thought about that too i was like yeah mcconaughey is like pretty devout christian and then i i actually don't know about woody harrelson yeah but that's like another shit. reason like, oh hey oh sorry no no it's, go ahead go ahead yeah, that, that's another reason that's like initially i was like this seems like more of a woody harrelson type of role and like mcconaughey would be the other guy but i was I was very wrong like as time went on i was like <laughs> i was like no actually <laughs> i don't think that's right it'd be weird if it was reversed yeah it it, it you know it helps too because i think they were really close friends um before the shooting of the show even started yeah and like their their chemistry is just it just it just goes to show how important that shit is like if two actors really like each other it really comes off yeah um like chemistry and charisma yeah. i think like carry like something that I mean, like, this is great. Obviously, it's well-written and well-directed and all that stuff. But even, like, you know, for when we watch, like, bad movies every now and then, like, sometimes, like, an actor's charisma or, like, the way the characters play off of each other can really save a movie. Like, Species, like, is one of those ones I think of. It's just, like, people knew what they were in kind of thing, and they just had a good time with it. Yeah. Them. And it just kind of saved the movie from being, you know, not fun or enjoyable. Yeah, or not self-aware. Yeah. Um, which is honestly not to get sidetracked, which is what makes Helldivers Two such a great game. Which is for anybody <laughs> or Starship that Troopers, is completely. O- yeah, or Starship Troopers. Look, okay, to, <laughs> in all transparency, Starship Troopers was the movie I wanted to do today because I thought that it would help our. Um, it would definitely help our uh, our popularity <laughs> oh, yeah. score our because SEO. it is Starship Troopers is yeah is in is trending insanely right now <laughs> like everyone is watching it and it makes me so happy yeah. because this this movie was just this weird it's dude it's my favorite movie i've been it's i've been saying that for years it has always been my favorite movie since i was fucking 10 years old yeah and to see an entirely new generation watching it and appreciating it and what's so great is that the cult classic that it is and the way that it's revered now for all of the uh you know just just for being a perfect example of of satire on you know military uh you know hyper patriotism and yeah the military machine and like it was so misunderstood when it came out and i'm just so happy that that this gets to be a part of its legacy and its renaissance yeah you know what i mean yeah because i think it was pretty underappreciated um, when it came out like people didn't get it or at least critics did i think audiences were more on board with it but yeah, yeah now it's got like that second life you know and i think it still holds the record for most live rounds of ammunition ever fired <laughs> uh in a movie yeah paul verhoven is known for his his squibs um because he directed um the guy who directed Starship Troopers directed um, RoboCop and uh, Total Recall. Have you ever seen those? Uh, I have seen the original Total Recall. I've actually never seen the original RoboCop. Oh shit! We might have to do that at some point. But I know he's... I need to. Apparently, the game is really good. The game that just came out—it's a really good homage to the original. Apparently, but anyway, oh, continue. Nice. No, he's just like he's he's famous for those like over-the-top squibs and like 
you know, rounds and explosions and all that kind of stuff. Like, uh, like in Total Recall, there there's some scenes that are so like over the top graphic, like dudes just getting shot to pieces, and like in RoboCop too, there's some crazy stuff in there. Yeah, I need to see RoboCop. But anyway, I I digress. There was I wanted to go back to to what you said about sort of that that nude scene being so jarring. So there's an interesting <laughs> piece of trivia. Yeah. According to Nick Pizzolatto, all of the nude scenes throughout the whole show, because I think there's several more, um, were actually HBO mandated. He would have been happy with no oh, nudity, wow. and there was no nudity originally written in his script. HBO demanded it. Dang. Okay, well, that explains a lot. Yeah, because it seemed a little uh, gratuitous. Not bad, but it was like, yeah, it was a little, like, uh, crossed over into, like, porny territory, like, towards the end of it, but... Yeah, man. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that was the thing, too. I was just like... <laughs> like, this is like his, his wife at home is gorgeous, and then he's, like, you know banging this gorgeous like it was just like we do what the fuck what the fuck is it's like it's just yeah uh i don't fucking know fucking hbo yeah lost all respect for him but maybe i'll get gain it back in the coming episodes <laughs> and i okay i want so i wanted to leave us with this last piece of trivia because like i said i could watch this for two hours straight but <laughs> over the course of the entire first season rust cole smoked or matthew mcconaughey smoked a total of 79 cigarettes and drank eight beers on camera <laughs> only eight that's not bad well i guess he's like in the I, <laughs> <laughs> he's in the interrogation room the whole time yeah i just had to point that out the uh <laughs> the commitment from mcconaughey Hell gotta yeah. love it i'm sure that was a really tough role <laughs> for him <laughs> And you know what? This is a perfect time to cut off this podcast because there's a giant car alarm going off okay. right in front of my uh, my window. But anyway, I'm so excited to continue our series on True Detective Season 1 with you. Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this with me. Yeah, I loved it. I, w- I would have loved it with no beers as well. I really enjoyed myself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess we... Yeah. See, this is the thing. I feel like we can't give our rating until we finish the show. Yeah, that's true. But he, thus far, I've, I'm thoroughly on board fuck yes all right well that's it we're gonna wrap up this first episode on true detective um my name is jeff my name is Emma. and remember <laughs> every tv show series or movie is better with at least one beer nicely done <laughs> see you next week bitches Bees. one guy seen it the other guy hasn't First guy's gonna tell the second guy all about it While they both get drunk